The 1979 science fiction movie Alien introduced us to one of the scariest alien creatures ever conceived, the Xenomorph. It was an acid-blooded horror with two sets of teeth. The movie also introduced us to its sinister juvenile forms, the infamous face huggers and chest bursters. But you know what? That's just art imitating life. There are many parallels in the insect world. This is the first in a two-part look in the connection between aliens in science fiction movies and insects. I'm a bit of a fan of science fiction and I really enjoyed the first Alien movie and its sequel, the 1986 Aliens. The later movies, not so much. The aliens, or xenomorphs, in both those movies had a terrifying set of extendable pharyngeal jaws. Here is my cheesy animation of cheesy those jaws. Effects. Where did that idea come from? H.R. Giger was the artist who designed the alien, and he said in an interview, I hadn't studied any particular animal. My instructions were that it should be somehow frightening and horrible, and I did my best. We came to the conclusion that we must give the beast a terrific set of teeth, or in this case, two sets. I wonder if Giga knew that extendable mouth parts are old hat in the insect world. Insects with such mouth parts have existed for hundreds of millions of years. I am referring to the larvae of damselflies and dragonflies. These aquatic predators have elaborate hinged mouth parts which they can extend forward rapidly. Check this out. And again in slow-mo. The extendable mouth part is known as a prehensile labial mask, or more simply, labium. At the end of the mask, depending on the species involved, is either a pair of sharp hooks to seize prey, or a scoop to capture prey. The labium is then retracted back to the other mouth parts, where the mandibles chew up the prey. I reckon that stacks up pretty well against the pharyngeal jaws of the xenomorph. What do you think? As to the general appearance of the xenomorph, the designer, Giga, and the director, Ridley Scott, clearly had insects in mind. We decided to make a very elegant creature, quick and like an insect, said Giga. Ridley Scott said, I wanted him insect-like, like an ant. Because if you examine an ant under a microscope, they're kind of elegant. And I wanted him to be very elegant and dangerous. The xenomorph also had acidic blood, which could melt through metal. What was the inspiration for that? Ridley Scott said, The alien's acid blood reminded the writer, Dan O'Bannon, of these ants that spray jets of acid to combat enemy ants. Scott is referring to the formic acid that stingless ants of the subfamily Formicini spray to defend themselves and their nests. The green tree ant of northern Australia is a classic example. You can see the ants here have their abdomens raised, ready to spray formic acid. They were defending their nest. But the xenomorph doesn't spray acid. The acid is in its blood. Clearly it's a defensive fluid. I mean, you're not going to take a bite out of a xenomorph if you know its blood is acidic. Is there a parallel in the insect world? Of course, many. Beetles of two families, the blister beetles and the false blister beetles, produce cantharidin, a blistering chemical. Cantharidin is toxic to humans, where it causes irritation, blistering and bleeding. The cantharidin is contained in the haemolymph, which is insect blood. It's a defensive fluid released through reflex bleeding when the beetles are disturbed. It pays to not pick up one of these beetles if you want to avoid blisters on your skin. It gets even more interesting. Cantharidin is produced by the male, and it's transferred to the female during copulation. The females then apply the chemical to their eggs as protection from predators, and it's also present in the larvae of these beetles. Spanish fly, a preparation of pulverised beetles with cantharidin, has been used by humans for hundreds of years for medicinal purposes and also as an aphrodisiac. Hmm. Good luck with that one. Similar in appearance to blister beetles are the soldier beetles of the family Cantharidae. 
there are about 6,000 species of these distributed around the world. Soldier beetles are usually brightly coloured. Apparently these colours are similar to the colours of uniforms worn by soldiers in the 18th and 19th centuries, hence their common name, soldier beetles. Those bright colours, technically known as aposematic colours, are a warning to potential predators. Adult soldier beetles and their larvae possess glands that secrete repulsive compounds to make them distasteful to predators. This is what the larva of an Australian soldier beetle looks like when it's disturbed. See those drops of white defensive fluid? Research has found that this chemical defense mechanism has been used for quite some time by soldier beetles. Soldier beetles may gather in very large numbers. That's certainly true of the Australian soldier beetle, commonly known as the plague soldier beetle. Over summer, soldier beetles swarm in large numbers on the flowers of exotic and native trees and shrubs. The purpose of the swarming is thought to be for mating and to also feed on nectar and pollen and even small insects on those flowers. Soldier beetles are not pests. They are predators. There are many other examples of insects secreting chemicals as a defensive strategy. I reckon we got time for just one more. The larvae of some leaf beetles in Australia possess a pair of glands that secrete a fluid containing hydrogen cyanide, benzaldehyde and glucose. Yep, I did say hydrogen cyanide. Insects that attack these larvae, for example, you know, perhaps an ant might attack them. Those insects have been observed to die within a few minutes of coming into contact with those glands. But let's get back to the aliens. The xenomorph's life cycle is based on the life cycle of a parasitic wasp. The writer Dan O'Bannon said, I also patterned the alien's life cycle on real life parasites. The executive producer Ron Schusert said, It was our idea that it would be the life cycle of an insect. The way a wasp will sting a spider, paralyze it, and then lay an egg in it. And just so you know what we're talking about, here is an image of an Australian spider hunter dragging a paralysed huntsman spider back to its nest to lay an egg on it. Wasps aren't the only parasites of spiders. Some flies also parasitise spiders. I've linked a video about them up in the cards and I've also linked it in the description. And if you like this video so far, why not give it a thumbs up? The life cycle of a xenomorph is egg to face hugger to chest burster to adult. Let's look at those face huggers. In appearance, an insect parallel might be a bat fly. There is an amazing image taken by Piotrinus Grecki of a bat fly face hugging a bat. I can't use it here, but I've, um, for copyright reasons, so I've linked it in the description. Meanwhile, this is what a bat fly looks like. Jesse it's a bloodsucker. Fix. But the alien face hugger is an eight legged parasitoid. Its purpose is to implant an embryo into a host, usually a human. The embryo then develops into a chest burster inside the host. Eight-legged parasitoids are a Hollywood invention, but six-legged parasitoids are abundant. These are the insects we commonly refer to as parasites. In my videos, I usually refer to parasitic wasps and parasitic flies as parasites, but the correct entomological term is parasitoid. The distinction is a parasitoid spends most of its juvenile stages within a host or on a host and eventually kills that host. On the other hand, a parasite feeds in or on a host and doesn't kill it. Think of lovely creatures like tapeworms, for example. It would be counterproductive to kill their host. After the facehugger comes the chest burster. But wait, I hear the sound of sci-fi aficionado shouting at their screens. They're probably trying to tell me that the facehugger does not insert an embryo into its host. Yep, there's a new theory introduced in um, some of the later movies, I believe. What is currently accepted is the facehugger inserts a mutagenic substance into the host's esophagus. This mutagen uses the host's cells and assembles a chest burster from the host's own biological material. Surely there's no insect parallel here. Yep. 
gall-inducing insects. Galls form as a reaction to insects feeding on or laying their eggs into plant tissues. What might happen is the female inserts an egg from which hatches a larva, which then alters the plant through its own salivary secretions, forming a gall around itself so it has somewhere safe to feed. Take that, facehugger. Now we can talk about chest bursters. This is when the early stage xenomorph bursts out of its host. In the Alien movie, it famously and very gorily burst out of John Hurt's chest. While researching for this video, I came across an urban myth about this scene. The myth being that the actors had no idea that an alien would burst out of John Hurt's chest in a shower of blood and gore. And that's why they looked so shocked. Here's what John Hurt himself said about that. The myth said they didn't know what was going to happen. Well, of course they knew what was going to happen because they'd read the script, but they didn't know how it was going to happen. In other words, they weren't aware of how violently the blood and gore was going to explode out. And also, according to the director, the other actors hadn't actually seen what the chest burster looked like. Chest burster sounds like a concept that could only have been dreamt up in Hollywood, but it happens regularly in the insect world. For example, during the warmer months of the year, you are likely to have parasitic wasp larvae emerging from caterpillars somewhere in your garden. The wasp larvae need to emerge so that they can pupate on the outside. The similarities with the emergence of a chest burster is rather striking, I think. What do you reckon? If you want to see how little wasps breed inside aphids, check out this video up here. Meanwhile, Stay tuned for part two and thanks for watching.